Good afternoon. Welcome to TNC Radio.live. And this is the Truckers Network Radio Show. Now, here's your host, Shelly Johnson. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate that. Yes, this is the Truckers Network Radio Show on TNC Radio.live, where we offer the entertainment, sports, weather, traffic, news, and information that commercial drivers want and need to hear. Many of our drivers like to read books and legal thrillers and crime novels. They're a genre that are very popular today. Today, we have the author of the Zachary Blake legal thriller series with us. These are hard-hitting, topical, and thought-provoking books. Mark M. Bello is an attorney, civil justice advocate, and award-winning author of the Zachary Blake legal thriller series. He's also co-host of the Justice Counts podcast. Bellow draws upon 44 years of courtroom experience and a passion for justice to write captivating novels and hard-hitting commentaries. His latest book in his series, Betrayal at the Border, is scheduled for release at the end of the year. Welcome, Mark. Thank you so much for being with us today. Shelley, a pleasure to be here. You know, I find it interesting that you decided to become an author after having a stellar career as an attorney. How about you tell us a little bit about yourself and how everything evolved? You've had some high-profile cases. Well, the, the, the legal career uh, turned out to be an incentive for the novelist career. Early in my practice, uh, I was 32, to be exact. I'm 69 now, so you can uh, figure out how long ago this was. Uh, I got a phone call from a client who said that uh, a friend of his Uh, had uh, kids who were involved in a child abuse situation with uh, their uh, church pastor. And the uh, priest was being prosecuted, but they wanted damages from the church. And back then, uh, clergy abuse was kind of a dirty little secret. It wasn't something that everybody was aware of. It wasn't something that the church was publicizing for sure. And uh, a lot of law enforcement officials, including judges, were protective, not of the innocent citizens, but more of the church. So you'd have things like uh, a predecessor case being settled in the civil justice system, and then a confidentiality agreement being signed and a court seal being issued so that no one knew that this particular priest was involved in a prior situation. What that did obviously is it prevented a second victim from ever realizing there was a first and it made it very easy for uh, a predator priest to continue doing the bad things that he was doing. It's it, it, for lack of a better way to say it, and I'm sure your trucker community won't mind me saying so, but it was half-assed backwards. Right. Instead of, instead of representing and, and uh, championing the interests of the victims, they were representing and championing the interest in legal situations of the church and the predators. So, uh, you know, years ago after I, uh, I, I handled it, I did well, uh, my clients, uh, were well compensated. Uh, I exposed the conspiracy. Uh, I refused to participate in the kinds of behaviors that my predecessors did. And by the way, lawyers were complicit in this as well. Uh, so I refused to do any of that. Mm-hmm. And the end result was that this case followed this guy for the rest of his life. Uh, I always promised myself I'd write a book about the experience, mm-hmm. and 30 some odd years later in 2016, Betrayal of Faith was born, and it's about, it's a fictional account, it's not a, uh, a non-fiction book, uh, it, it basically tells the reader or the listener, if you're a trucker, don't read it, don't read and drive guys or girls, uh, <laughs> um, right. but it, it tells, it tells the, uh, the listener what it felt like. Uh, it felt like a major CIA type conspiracy. And that's kind of what I wrote. 
How long did it take for this case to be resolved? Um, you were one of the first, am I correct? I mean, I, I was. Yes. Uh, this was this was uh, again very early on a dirty mm -hmm. little secret. Sure. The when you say I was one of the first, my clients were not one of the first victims, wow. but litigation over these kinds of events uh, didn't start happening until the 60s and 70s. In my case, um, well, 70s more so than 60s. Uh, my case resulted from an incident that happened uh, in 1977. Mm -hmm. The litigation was started in 1984 and completed, I'm sorry, in 1982 and completed in 1984. Okay. And it's interesting, we weren't hearing anything about this in the media until I want to say 15 years ago, uh, maybe 20 at the most. It just really did not uh, hit the mainstream news of what was going on. Well, I'll, I'll give you a great example. This particular priest, uh, and, and that's an interesting story all by itself. Uh, remind me to tell you what's going on right now. Uh, but the the priest had done this before. There was a family, and I'm finding out that there were several families, uh, but there was a family in a prior community in Michigan. Four boys were molested by the same priest, and that case never hit the news, never was never reported in the courts, and was quietly settled before the priest was transferred to the community where my boys were molested and without question the way that case was handled and covered up resulted in the molestation of several other children including the two i've represented and that's the sad part about the story absolutely and and these are things that uh, people live with for the rest of their lives it's, oh yeah it's a terrible scar the uh, the point I wanted to make about the present time mm -hmm. is here's this guy and this is an interesting story all by itself uh, the priest after he left the Detroit area was transferred to Cleveland Ohio I wrote a letter to the Cleveland plain dealer and I said uh, I pursued this case the case has been resolved the priest is a predator he's in your community now uh, Watch yourselves, buyer beware. And they up and transferred him to Baltimore, Maryland, oh. where I wrote a letter to the Baltimore newspaper Good for and you. did exactly the same thing. And I was determined to follow this guy wherever he went. Mm -hmm. He finally got the proc and left the clergy. The, his supervisor uh, was the archbishop of Oakland County, I think it was, or the Bishop of Oakland County, excuse me. And I took his deposition and he lied to me in, under oath, as did everybody I deposed uh, for the church. Um, and he promptly left Michigan and became the Archbishop of Joliet, Illinois, oh, which is a suburb of Chicago. Mm -hmm. Fast forward 40, 50 years, the priest involved in my case gets arrested and charged by the Michigan Attorney General who has, open, who has reopened every single Michigan case involving uh, clergy molestation, including this one. Mm -hmm. Where is this guy found and arrested? Joliet, Illinois. Wow. He oh. goes right back to his mentor mm -hmm. uh, who's been protecting him for 50 years. Uh, it, it's just, you can't make this stuff up. It's, yeah. In this case, in this situation, fact is, is more interesting than fiction. Wow. It's, it blows my mind. Yep. Now, there, there is no statute of limitations on this. Well, one. There, there is a statute is of limitations, but it... it in the civil cases, there's definitely a statute of limitations. Right. Uh, the only reason that that uh, my clients were able to extend the statute of limitations, as I mentioned, seventy-seven to 
uh, 82 right. is because the statute doesn't start running on you until your 18th birthday. Oh, I see. Okay. So a, a child can, can take advantage of an extended statute of limitations. Mm -hmm. There are also many um, communities, many jurisdictions who permit an extension of the statute of limitations in a predatory situation where perhaps repressed memory comes into play. Sure. Uh, a traumatic event happens to you, you repress your memory of that event and you recover your memory later on and you can, you can extend the statute of limitations in those situations. Now there's a difference between a criminal statute and a civil statute. And I'm not a criminal lawyer, but I'm, I, I believe what happened here is that legislation had to be passed to extend the criminal statute of limitations that allowed uh, this case to be pursued criminally later on. I think I had read somewhere that the statute for predatory behavior, uh, molestation and sexual assault had been extended. I didn't know if it was yeah, so, something like state. that. Yeah, right. Something like that. Well, and it, and, it only and, seems right because these people are victims, you know. By the way, the other the other interesting thing about this case from a criminal standpoint mm -hmm. is way back then in the 70s, this particular priest did serve time. He served six months and he served six months for fourth degree criminal sexual conduct, which amounts to fondling. He was guilty of much more than that, but he was allowed to plead to a six month fourth degree uh, for something that was a, a lot more severe than that. Wow. Another part of the so-called cover up. Oh, sure. Oh, it's just insidious. And, and the people that were victimized, you have to wonder, you know, it's an emotional scar that they have to live with. It's terrible. It uh, is it, very terrible. Um, I, I have some client confidentiality issues here, but let's just say that my clients have not led, at least one of them have not led a uh, superlative uh, adult life as a result sure. of this incident, yeah. and I and I hear these stories all the time. It's just mm -hmm. it's just tragic. It really I had is. a gentle, I had a gentleman from Minnesota on my on my podcast who was handling the St. Paul uh, cases. There's a huge uh, scandal in this uh, and the uh, in the St. Paul Minnesota area, and the diocese uh, in St. Paul went bankrupt which prevents people from resolving their cases. Eventually they'll get resolved, but it's a, that's another one of their little techniques uh, for, to delay uh, justice. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he has some very interesting stories to tell uh, on my Justice Counts podcast, which, which uh, the truckers can, uh, can find uh, somewhere online and listen to. It's, a, it's an interesting, it was an interesting interview. Some very it hasn't, been, it hasn't been posted yet. We definitely want you to give that link later in the interview so people know where they can reach you and where they can get your books. I can, uh, I can do that. More about it. Bravo to you to standing up for justice. And now people can read, get a good idea of what all of this was about with Betrayal of Faith. That was the first book in your series. This is the Truckers Network radio show on TNC Radio Live. Definitely stay tuned for more. This is some compelling information and a great, great set of novels. Great leaders challenge their people not to stop at the first right answer. Tighten the Lug Nuts is the book that will help you move past that first right answer to be more effective, more productive, and more successful. This book serves as a blueprint that can be easily applied by leaders, entrepreneurs, truckers, owner-operators, all of us in our everyday lives. This is one of the best leadership books you can read to help you accelerate towards your personal and professional goals. Plus, a portion of the proceeds will be donated to truckerschristmasgroup.org. Visit tightenthelugnuts.com to order your copy today. This is the Truckers Network radio show here on TNC Radio Live. I'm Shelby Johnson with Tom Kelly. We're talking with Mark Bello, attorney and author of the Zachary Blake legal thriller series. Mark, we were talking about your first book, which is Betrayal of Faith, that launched your series. 
and it's based on some of the facts and the, the experiences of when you actually uh, were one of the first attorneys to sue uh, over the abuse in, in the Catholic Church by a priest in Michigan. Compelling information, shocking, obviously. What should the church have done to bring offenders to justice and protect those kids? I mean, has anything really changed? I guess that, that might be a question some of the listeners might have. Well, I, I, would, say, I would say yes, but it would, it's taken an awful long time. Mm-hmm. The book, the book, as I indicated earlier, is a fictional account. So it creates uh, a organization called the Coalition, and the Coalition is like a CIA type organization within the Catholic Church. Actually, I don't call it the Catholic Church in the book; I call it the Church. Uh, but the Coalition's job is to keep these things quiet by any means possible, and they will do basically anything. Uh, anything to prevent these things from becoming public. And, and that, while that's an exaggeration and an embellishment of the truth, again, this is fiction, not fact, um, it's, near, it's near truth. Mm-hmm. Uh, the church has been silently paying off victims and communities for their silence for years. And only recently, when the cover has been blown off of these in some rather high profile cases, including the one I mentioned in St. Paul, there was one in Louisiana. uh, And there's of course the most famous one in in the Massachusetts area where the film Spotlight comes from. Um, They basically blown the lid off of these uh, conspiratorial behavior, and, and now the Pope has gotten involved. Uh, but if you ask me, can these people be trusted? Can, can we be assured that this behavior has ended? I, I would say no. And the reason I would say no is, look where we are. We're still talking about this mm-hmm. 50-something years sure. after the earlier incidents that I mentioned. Why? because of the behavior I just talked about. So how can the church be uh, trusted to prevent and end this stuff when they weren't doing it 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago? This has been going on a a long, long time. So I just just don't trust uh, this, oh, I don't know, self policing that they are suggesting they're doing Mm -hmm. i'm dubious and you know what's interesting uh, obviously what's come to the forefront uh, even in um, college situations where that predatory physician in michigan was it michigan state that was going on for decades uh, where it was obviously sexual abuse yeah think about that i mean it, Ah. it it just keeps for some reason or other, rather than fess up and face the music, our first inclination, whether we're the church, whether we're the university president, uh, whether we're the archbishop, whether we're a Supreme Court justice, which is one of my books, um, uh, whether we're the president of the United States, our first inclination is to deny and refuse. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be what's going on here. Instead of doing the right thing, uh, for some reason or other, people in power tend to do the wrong thing. Yeah, I mean, I found it absolutely shocking that the universities were allowing this sort of thing to go on. And there had been whistleblowers, but they were ignored, where athletes are being abused by a physician. Two two different universities, too. Yes. Yes. There's something that's come out with U of M as well. It's, it's not just in Michigan. This sort of thing is not isolated, I'm sure. Oh, there was, a, there was an LA case as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I'm sure, and I'm sure there's many more that, that are, 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 you know, hidden in the woods somewhere that'll come out of the woodworks on one of these days. It's so just, very, it's very sad. Oh, it's, it's sick. It's, it's, it's uh, totally unacceptable. It's the 21st century. Why the heck is this going on? 
And in your books, do you explore the evil nature? Is the person, is your character evil? Uh, or do you get into their psyche as to why they're doing this sort of thing and, and what is causing the cover-ups? I've, d- I've done both, actually. Uh, mm-hmm. I, in, in my book, uh, well, in the first book, because, my, because of my experience, Everybody's evil. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I, I didn't cut anybody any slack. Okay. Uh, I, I do cut slack in future books in situations where slack is, is deserved. Uh, and we can get into that a little bit. The, the, the thing about the universities and, and the church for that matter, I, I believe the predators are less guilty than the enablers yes Uh, i expect predatory behavior there are bad people in the world what i don't expect is that people who are otherwise good to enable predators to not only prey on their first victim but to prey on several behind that victim after the so-called good person finds out about the behavior and that's what keeps happening in these cases I don't understand how you can possibly say, for instance, one of the things I heard way back in the 80s was, well, we have a shortage of priests. That justifies allowing a priest to keep his job so he can molest children? Uh. I'd rather a layperson uh, ran the service. Yes. Yeah. That I, I mean, what, what would be your choice? A, a lay clergyman or a, a predatory clergyman? Uh, a lay clergyman. <laughs> Certainly there should be no predators at all. It's a, it's a frigging no-brainer. Yes, yes. But that was one of the excuses I heard. We all, we have a shortage of priests. Give me a break. So in your mind, what do you think uh, makes people just kind of brush it under the rug? When they're told this, why do they enable that? Is it because they're more concerned about their own future than they are somebody else's? Well, that's one reason. Uh, the other, the the other reason is money. Yeah. They thought that by covering things up, they'd pay out less money. Uh, and for a while, that worked. Once you blow the lid off the conspiracy, though, the conspiracy ends up costing you more money. And the appropriate way to do this. Uh, would have been to disclose the behavior, get rid of the bad actors, and you would have saved an awful, an awful lot of money and an awful lot of heartache. Uh, there are people who, have, who are deceased today who committed suicide following events like the ones I just described to you. And that, okay. goes, on both, that goes on both sides of the uh, events. The bad actors uh, out of guilt or out of shame, commit suicide, right. and the innocent victims thinking that they've betrayed their church somehow, or or uh, are guilty of uh, of some terrible behavior at the age of eleven or twelve, right. uh, can't handle the guilt. It's it's just such a sad, sad situation. Well, it's insidious. The the predators, no doubt, using mind control and saying. You- you're the bad person, you know, telling the victim this, you need to be quiet about it, all of these things. And yes, it, it just becomes embedded in, in, in their psyche and they do carry this guilt. And, and that's just so wrong. They also inject yeah. God. Yeah. Uh, the the that's Lord that's loves that. clean bodies. Let's take a shower. <sighs> I mean, it's disgusting. I, yeah. I can't, I can't begin to tell you. It just, uh, It's so foreign to me. I'm just an adult and a kid. And you use your position as a priest and your connection with God Mm -hmm. to persuade a a very persuadable child that this is an appropriate uh, and uh, moral thing to do. Right. So, you know, keep in mind that we're not only dealing with, oh, my God, um, child molestation, Mm -hmm. but, oh, my God, I was a church-going faithful believer, and 
that's been the rug's been pulled out from under me. Yeah. It's a terrible situation. It really, really, really is. We're going to be covering more of the topics that you've covered in your legal series, the Zachary Blake Legal Thriller Series by Mark M. Bello. He's an attorney and author. We're talking with him today. This is the Truckers Network radio show on TNC Radio. Live. Definitely stay tuned for more coming up. This is a very special shout out to all our truckers from Starcom Racing is Quinn Hoff on TNC Radio. Live. I uh, just wanted to give a special shout out to all the truckers out there listening. You know, uh, there's a lot of storms out there. Just stay safe. And uh, I appreciate everything they do for our country. Like I said, that I don't know if you guys heard earlier without trucks, America stops moving. And I know that well myself coming from a family trucking business. And, uh, you know, obviously everyone needs truck drivers. So if you need a, uh, you need a truck driving position, be sure to check out how transfer. And uh, I appreciate you. This is the Truckers Network radio show on TNC Radio. Live. I'm Shelly Johnson with Tom Kelly. We're talking with Mark M. Bello, attorney and author of the Zachary Blake Legal Thriller series. Mark, your books really explore a lot of hard facts that you've encountered very likely as an attorney, am I correct? Litigating cases. Is that is it the evil part of humanity you encountered so much in the courtroom that's really inspired you to put it in, in into a novel so that people can really explore what's really going on out there? Well, only the only the first book did that. Okay. I, I would say I would say that that I tend to be a victim's advocate lawyer. Okay. So I tend to side, for lack of a better way to say it. Uh, sympathize with and and incorporate the mentality of the victim rather than the perpetrator. Now there are there are different categories and levels of uh, perpetrator. Some perpetrators are not re- don't realize that their behavior is uh, deplorable. Uh, in in the case of the of the church, as I described, while the priest is a predator, the archbishop or the bishop is covering up a crime because he thinks that he's benefiting his parish by keeping it quiet. His um, motives may have some. I don't know, uh, appropriate um, aspect to them, but they're misplaced. And again, I, I mentioned earlier that I thought some of them were worse than the than the predator. But I, but my point is that I think they think that they're doing something out of uh, duty or the institution and those people are dangerous i I much i much prefer a vicious predator (laughs) well at least you know what you're dealing with exactly so what's inspired your other novels you have a total of what six how how many are in your series there is there are uh, five more published and uh, Mm -hmm. as you mentioned in the in the intro uh, a sixth on the way I don't know if you want to talk about that. Uh, it's scheduled for release at the end of the year. It's Betrayal at the Border. Um, I'm happy to talk about that. Okay. If you wanted to tell us a little bit about uh, what that's about. You want to, you want to go in that order? Ba- backwards? backwards. Well, <laughs> okay. Whichever you'd like. I know that I'm happy, I'm happy to do that. The, the uh, Betrayal at the Border mm-hmm. is, a, is an immigration um, crisis study. Okay. It, it uh, it takes two situations. Um, the first is uh, an a immigrant, an immigrant couple uh, who entered the United States legally and overstayed their welcome. Uh, did not uh, maintain their visa and became essentially illegal aliens. The second uh, set of immigrants are legal immigrants, uh, Muslim Americans from Syria, 
from Kobani who are legal citizens of the United States. Uh, the couple has a child. The mother's mother, the child's grandmother, still lives in Kobani. And the mother wants to take her to Syria now that things have calmed down there and meet the grandmother. Uh, without giving anything away, mm -hmm. uh, or without giving a lot away, <laughs> in the first situation, the uh, parent's plant is raided by ICE and the family is separated and the kids are whisked away into a, uh, an unknown detention center. In the second situation, the mother and child visit Syria and are kidnapped by ISIS. And Zachary Blake is called upon uh, along with his partner to resolve the hostage situation in Syria and reunite the family in Michigan. Okay. Uh, and that's essentially what the trail at the border is about. Well, certainly it's very topical immigration right now. It is. And the book takes a hard look at, the, at both types of situations. Um, I'm not a person who is, doesn't want people to follow the law, but I am a person, as most of us are. I wrote a blog the other day that talks about who is an American and, and who, gets the, who has the right to call themselves a Native American. And uh, I opined that only 2% of the population actually get to call themselves Native Americans. The rest of us, even though we were born here, are the children of immigrants. Sure. So I, I have a very sympathetic and expansive view of immigration. And if, I, if my ancestors benefited from a progressive immigration policy, I think we ought to apply that to those people who are struggling with our current immigration situation as well. Now, I know a lot of people disagree with me and, and uh, jobs are an issue. Is this person competing for my job? Is that person competing for my job? Uh, why don't they do things legally and honestly and, and come into the country the way my family did appropriately? Um, and, I, and I am sympathetic to that. I agree with that. But there are situations going on right now where people are being uh, treated almost as if we're a third world country. And I just think that we could do this a whole lot better and with a whole lot American citizen compassion than we currently are doing. That, that goes, by the way, for the Trump administration and the Biden administration. And before that, the Obama administration, which started the whole uh, detention and Guantanamo Bay kind of um, mentality. So I'm not, okay. I'm not leaving... Uh, anybody out of uh of my nation of blame <laughs> right yeah yeah they, they've been kind of kicking the can down the road yep. in so many ways yep. now your your main character in all of your books is zachary blake am i correct correct who is zachary blake zachary blake is an attorney mm -hmm. he's uh starts out as a failed attorney, somebody who is uh, uh, at, in the bar more often than he's in uh, court, uh, somebody who's ignoring and, and uh, deserting his clients. And he's teetering on the brink of alcoholism and bankruptcy until he gets a call from the mother of these two kids that I described in uh, betrayal of Faith, the first mm -hmm. book. Okay. Uh, following uh, what happens, let's say, <laughs> in, in uh, Betrayal of Faith, 
uh, Zachary regains his moxie, becomes a rather successful guy, and he starts handling high profile, uh, very socially um, relevant cases involving uh, David and versus Goliath situations. Mm -hmm. But, and again, in uh, in betrayal at the border, as I just described, he's taking on ISIS and negotiating um, uh, ransom in Syria. At the same time, he's taking on the federal government, ICE, and the immigration system in Michigan. Which would be no um, small undertaking there. <laughs> no question. Uh, and and it, that's true in all my books. In, in the second book, he takes on the president of the United States. In the third book, he takes on the cops and the white supremacists. In the fourth book, he takes on a city and a police department in a, in a, a traffic stop shooting of an innocent black man. Mm -hmm. In the fifth book, it's school shootings and uh, taking on the gun industry and the uh, city where the incident happened. Mm -hmm. And in the sixth book, which is Supreme Betrayal, he's taking on a, a Supreme Court justice who has committed a sexual assault. Uh, I don't, you don't need to guess what that case is based on, or that book is based on. Um, so again, I, what, I tend to take situations that are happening in America today mm -hmm. and turn them into uh, novels that take a hard look at, at uh, these situations sure. and, uh, and offer solutions uh, using the legal system and the political system for that matter uh, to resolve them uh, in ways that I think are appropriate. Uh, I'm not saying I'm right or wrong or a genius uh, or I've got all the answers, but I sure as hell have a lot of questions. Sure. And I try and I try to pose them in my books. And, and the reader can really think. It's thought provoking. They can see how the system works. Obviously, you have many, many years of insight as an attorney, so you know how the legal system works, and you know the challenges. They can walk in Zachary's shoes, and they can see what it's like, and maybe take a pause and say, okay, I had not thought about it from this angle. I mean, right. and, and that's a good book yep. because you're, you're challenging people to think, which is something that's definitely needed. We have to go to break here. We're talking with Mark M. Bello. He's the attorney and author of the Zachary Blake legal thriller series. It's very compelling and he's got some excellent points and some insights here. This is the truckers network radio show on TNC radio live. Stay tuned for more. Coming up. The info blog on TNC Radio.live is brought to you by the Truckers Network at app.thetruckersnetwork.net. A truck driver's guide to balancing work and home life. Truck driving is hard and demanding work. Becoming a truck driver means spending many hours and days on the road. You'll sacrifice a lot for your trucking career. For many long haul truck drivers, it's hard to separate life at work from life at home. Learning how to have a balance between home life and work life is essential if you want to have a long-lasting career in trucking. Check out our guide to balancing work and home life for truck drivers. Get enough sleep. Getting the recommended amount of sleep each night is a rare thing for truckers. Although sleep may be difficult for truckers because of the uncomfortable way of living, it's essential to their well-being and safety. Start prioritizing sleep and make a sleep schedule. Set an alarm for a certain time and turn off all electronics and get your much-needed sleep. Not enough sleep can make life on the road miserable. Exercise often. Due to the many hours of sitting each day, truckers start to experience body pain and health issues. Not exercising and taking care of your health can cause a lot of problems in the long run. You could be out of a job and possibly out of work. Eat healthy. Having your truck stocked with healthy snacks and meals while you're on the road will help teach you how to have a healthy work-life balance. Start making it a habit to go to the grocery store before you head out on the road. Also, avoid eating at fast food restaurants and truck stops. Do not think about work when you're at home. Whether you love trucking or hate it, you've probably thought about your job while you're off the clock. 
it can be difficult to separate the two. Thinking about work too much while you're at home can make you anxious, sleep-deprived, and put you in a bad mood. Instead of worrying about work, try picking up a new hobby or exercising. Spending time with friends and family can also get your mind off things. Make time for family. It doesn't matter if you're on the road or at home. Make time for family. Make it a priority to talk to someone in your family once a day. It can be tough for truckers, especially OTR truckers, to maintain relationships with their family due to the trucking lifestyle. Keeping in contact with your loved ones will help life on the road be less lonely. For more information, be sure to check out the Truckers Network at app.thetruckersnetwork.net. This is the Truckers Network radio show on TNC Radio.live. I'm Shelley Johnson with Tom Kelly. We're talking with Mark M. Bello, attorney and author of the Zachary Blake legal thriller series. Mark, you've been extremely busy. You said during break that you wrote a novella and a cookbook, and there are a bunch of great things that people can find on your website. <laughs> That's true. Um, the novella is, is called Lador Bador, which means in Hebrew, from generation to generation. Okay. And it tells the story of Zachary when he was 13 years old. His grandfather, it turns out, is a Holocaust survivor. And the, the old man has promised to tell Zach on his 13th birthday, the story of his escape from Auschwitz. And the book proceeds to tell the story. Okay. Uh, the novella, um, is available on my website, which is www.markembello.com for free. So you sign up, you leave your email address. Nothing's absolutely free. You got to leave an email address. Um, I'm trying to build a list here, you know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you get the, uh, the novella for free. Uh, and it's a pretty interesting um story about an escape from a prison camp, um, the ultimate prison camp, uh, Auschwitz. Uh, it is based, by the way, on a true story. Uh, I can't think of the gentleman's name, but a Polish Christian uh, escaped from Auschwitz with a couple of friends in a very daring escape. And I basically took that story and converted it into uh, Lador Bador from generation to generation. Um, the uh, cookbook that you mentioned mm -hmm. is uh, actually uh, my mother's family recipes from Poland and America uh, going back, I would say, to the early 1900s present we had a 75th family club anniversary party and one of the centerpieces of the party was to, to produce this cookbook um, that had a hundred years of recipes in it and I said isn't this neat I'll bet the public would love to see old-time Jewish recipes put together oh, in a in a rather entertaining form. So what I did was I created the Blake Lewin family cookbook and I um, made the family, Zachary Blake's family instead of Mark Bellow's family. Okay. And there's a lot of Jewish shtick and, and um, uh, old Jewish, Polish, Russian recipes uh, and some humor and fun as well. And uh, I enjoyed putting it together and it's, it's going to come out in about uh, two months. Uh, and it, it'll, it'll be available in that, on that same website. I've also written a series of children's safety books um, that uh, I'm putting the finishing touches on. The biggest issue when you write children's stuff is you have to have them illustrated. So yep. even though I finished the manuscripts, I needed to find a good illustrator, and that's uh, where I'm at right now with those. Excellent. But they're all about they're all about safety type topics, like 
um, texting and driving, uh, raising, raising and training a dog uh, safely, mm -hmm. uh, riding a bike safely, um, bullying, uh, which is um, has been an important topic for me. Uh, one of my one of my Zachary Blake novels, uh, Betrayal High, is about a tormented high school kid who uh, essentially commits a mass shooting in in his high school because of the fact mm -hmm. that he was uh, um, not one of the cool kids and got bullied mercilessly right. in, in high school. We have about 15 so, seconds. Where can people find this again? MarkMBello.com or on Amazon, just Google my name, M-A-R-K, middle initial M, last name B-E-L-L-O, and you'll find the books. Thank you so much, Mark. You've been a wonderful guest, and, and definitely people need to check out your website. Some great books here. What's great is your first five books are available on Audible. That would be audible.com. So people can just check that out and listen while they're driving. You're listening to TNC Radio.Live. I'm Shelby Johnson on the Truckers Network Radio Show. Stay tuned for more. Thank you for listening to another great interview on TNC Radio.Live and the Truckers Network Radio Show. All of the material you hear on TNC Radio.Live on our website, our broadcasts, or our podcasts are copyrighted. There can be no distribution without the express consent of TNC Radio.Live and its partners. For inquiries, write us at info at tncradio.live.